Check out the Virtual Contracting Enterprises video for debriefing to learn the proper procedures and best practices for conducting debriefings to unsuccessful offerers on the basis of the selection decision and contract award. Thanks for watching and have a great Army day! Our team just started the proposal evaluation on a major competitive acquisition last week. At this early stage, while the evaluation team is just beginning to read through the proposals, I wanted to sit down with you and our SSEB chair, Major Torres, and review the proper procedures and best practices for conducting debriefings. I just want to make sure we are properly prepared and well organized when the time comes to actually conduct the debriefings. Great idea. Before we start, can one of you explain to me why the government is required to give debriefings to unsuccessful offers? Sure. The primary purpose of a debriefing is to explain the rationale for exclusion from the competitive range or non-selection for award to an unsuccessful offerer. Since each offerer puts considerable resources into preparing and submitting a proposal, Fairness dictates that the government should promptly explain to the offer why its proposal was unsuccessful. In addition to providing the offerer a clear understanding of the reason for the selection decision, other benefits can also be drawn from a thorough debriefing. The offerer can gain a better understanding of how to submit improved proposals when it competes for future acquisitions, and a better, more competitive proposal in the future and a better ability to determine whether further attempts to compete for agency contracts are worth the investment of resources necessary. Such a debriefing can also serve to enhance the agency's relationship and credibility with industry. Another benefit that can spring from a well-planned and executed debriefing is the instilling of confidence in the offerer that it has been treated fairly. Qualified personnel evaluated its proposal and that the decision complies with statutes, regulations, and the solicitation. Such a result can go a long way toward reducing the chances of a protest. But be aware that the converse is also true. A poorly done debriefing can actually cause a protest. Wow, the most important point I'm taking away from this discussion so far is that the briefing is an integral part of the evaluation team's work and their jobs are not really complete until the debriefings have been conducted. That's an excellent takeaway. Would we ever give a debriefing to the successful offer? The one we award the contract to? Sure. Many of the same benefits, such as improved proposals in future competitions, and enhanced relationships and credibility with industry are equally applicable to the successful offerer. And giving the successful offerer a debriefing is not legally prohibited. Now that I understand its importance, how much information should we be giving the offer during a debriefing? Well, that depends on whether it is a pre-award debriefing or a post-award debriefing. Offerers are only entitled to one debriefing, either pre-award or post-award, but not both. The pre-award debriefing is more restrictive in terms of what may be disclosed to the unsuccessful offerer since the procurement would still be ongoing at the time of the debriefing. FAR 15.505 describes what should be discussed and what cannot be disclosed at a pre-award debriefing. FAR 15.506 does the same with respect to a post-award debriefing. To summarize those two FAR sections that Carol just mentioned, at a pre-award debriefing, we should only discuss the detailed results of the evaluation of that particular offeror's proposal, including all strengths, weaknesses and deficiencies, 
a summary of the rationale for eliminating the offeror from the competition, and provide reasonable responses to relevant offeror questions about whether source selection procedures contained in the solicitation and applicable regulations were followed in the process of eliminating the offeror from the competition. We should not be disclosing anything about the other offerers' proposals, not even who the other offerers are or how many there are. However, at a post-award debriefing, we should not only discuss the detailed results of the evaluation of that particular offeror's proposal, we should also disclose the factor and sub-factor level ratings and total evaluated cost or price of the successful offeror's proposal. But we must not engage in point-by-point -point comparisons of a debriefed offeror's proposal with the successful offeror's proposal, or any other proposals for that matter. We should disclose the overall ranking of all offerers if such a ranking is developed during the source selection. We should also discuss a summary of the rationale for the award decision. One way this can be accomplished is by simply providing the debriefed offerer a redacted copy of the source selection decision document. And, of course, we should also provide reasonable responses to relevant offerer questions about whether source selection procedures contained in the solicitation and applicable regulations were followed during the source selection. Note that we are also prohibited during both pre-award and post-award debriefings from disclosing any information exempt from release under the Freedom of Information Act, such as trade secrets, privileged or confidential manufacturing processes and techniques, commercial and financial information that is privileged or confidential, including cost breakdowns, profit, indirect cost rates, and similar information, and the names of individuals providing reference information about an offeror's past performance. Thanks. That's a good point. Now, I would like to spend some time talking about what the agenda should look like for a debriefing. I made up this chart to facilitate our discussion. It depicts a notional agenda for a post-award debriefing. I like this agenda for a post-award debriefing, but how would you change it for a pre-award debriefing? I think the only thing I would change for a pre-award debriefing is agenda item number five. I would delete number five and its three sub-bullets and replace them with a new number five which simply says, briefly explain why the offeror was eliminated from the competitive range. I would keep everything else on the agenda the same. Excellent. That works for me. I think you've got the right informational content and a logical sequence for presenting that content. I may have missed this, but tell me again, why would you revise agenda item number five if this was a pre-award debriefing? Well, two reasons, really. First, if it's a pre-award debrief, the source selection decision hasn't been made yet, so the information in the unrevised agenda item number five is not available yet. Second, the source selection would still be ongoing at that time, and so, to disclose any of the information mentioned in the unrevised agenda item number five to the offer would be an unauthorized and improper disclosure of source selection information in violation of the Procurement Integrity Act. Right, Carol? That is correct. Now, Major Torres, I want to go over how I like to administer this agenda because I'm going to need some help from you. Great, because I want to make sure I understand upfront everything we need to be prepared for. That should make it easier to be better prepared. We will debrief the offerers one at a time. Of course, we all know that it is my responsibility as the contracting officer to chair and control the debriefing and select the government attendees. I will be the one in charge during the debriefing, even if I am not actually presenting the debriefing points or slides. While I should have no problem handling agenda items 1, 2, and 3 myself, I am probably going to need support from the SSEB to handle agenda items 4, 5, and 6. Agenda items 7 and 8 are fairly straightforward, and I should also be able to handle them myself. What kind of support do you want or need from the SSEB? 
Do you want the whole team to attend the debriefing? Agenda items 4, 5, and 6 are probably the most critical to the offerer because they provide the most informational value, usefulness, or worth to the offerer from a business perspective. So we need to have the right subject matter experts available to provide sufficient information to support the evaluation results. I think a best practice for this part of the debriefing is to have the SSEB chair present the evaluation results using the exact same briefing slides for that particular offerer that were used to brief the source selection authority. I prefer to have all the other members of the evaluation team in another room close at hand so that they are easily accessible if needed to answer questions or provide more detailed information. But I normally don't like to have everybody actually in the debriefing room. The more people in the room, the harder it is for me to maintain control of the debriefing. Can we use the factor chairs to present their respective factor results? Who we actually bring in the debriefing room is always a case-by-case -case determination. Generally speaking, I think a best practice is to limit the government attendance in the room to the contracting officer, SSEB chair, and lawyer. But I am always open to adding additional people, such as factor or subfactor chairs, or other subject matter experts from the evaluation team, if I determine they are needed to effectively and clearly explain the evaluation results. So that is something you and I and Carol should talk about as we get closer to a specific debriefing. I'm okay with that. Just curious, though. Do you also limit the number of attendees from the offerer side? Definitely not. The offerer should be allowed to bring whoever they wish to bring to the debriefing. However, in the letter to the offerer announcing the time, date, and place for the debriefing, I do think it is a best practice to request the names and job titles of everyone the offerer wants to bring to the debriefing. Knowing who is coming will help us to be better prepared to handle whatever subject may come up during the debriefing. I generally do not make the final decision about who the government attendees will be until after I know who the offerer is bringing to the debriefing and what their job title is. There is another reason asking for the offerer's attendees' names and job titles can be helpful. It is always a good idea to have someone attending the debriefing from the offerer's side that is at a level of the company above the proposal manager or writer. Having a company person in the debriefing that is not as heavily invested in the proposal from an emotional or financial perspective can bring a heightened and helpful level of objectivity to the offerer's side of the table at a debriefing. As long as we were talking about things like the emotions of people at the table, I wanted to ask if we have to do debriefings face-to-face. -face. You said we should use the same briefing slides we used for the decision brief to the source selection authority. Couldn't we just send the unsuccessful offer those briefing slides and tell the offer to call us if they have any questions? We cannot just send the offerer the briefing slides with a statement, if you have any questions, contact me. That is not a debriefing. However, if the offerer receives the briefing slides or the summary of the rationale for the competitive range or award decision with its unsuccessful offerer letter and just wants to talk to a couple of slides, it's the offerer's call. There is no requirement that debriefings be conducted face-to-face. They could also be conducted by telephone or some other electronic means, such as video teleconferencing. In fact, it may be burdensome for an offerer to attend in person, and the needs of the offerer should be given due consideration. However, the face-to-face -face technique is a best practice from my perspective. In a debriefing, the government is the bearer of bad news, and we all know from personal experience that the most appropriate way to deliver bad news is in person, if at all possible, right? I understand. Face-to-face -face is preferred. But we do have other options. Is it fair to say that you think a paper-only debriefing would be the least favored option? Absolutely. If we're going to use some method other than face-to-face -face 
to conduct the debriefing, such as teleconference or video conference, would you revise the agenda we have been discussing in any way? No, I don't think I would. This agenda should work well for any medium used to conduct the debriefing. Except paper only, of course. As long as we're talking about best practices, the best way to be prepared for a debriefing is to have at least one dry run prior to the actual debriefing by the contracting officer, legal, and the SSEB chair. Such a dry run could be presented to some of the SSEB members so they can provide any comments to help the debriefing go smoothly. A dry run is definitely a good tool for preparation, but I have another good one that can be used even earlier in the source selection process. Major Torres, you should tell your evaluators to always test the soundness of their evaluations, findings, and ratings by continually asking themselves, how would I explain this to the offerer? In fact, the asking of this question could even start as early as when the source selection plan is being developed and the evaluation factors and subfactors are being selected. I like that one. Since we are thinking about how we would explain things to an offerer, let's also think about our demeanor toward the offerer during a debriefing. Maintaining the proper demeanor during a debriefing is very important. Government personnel must always remember that the offeror's proposal has just been determined to be unacceptable, outside the competitive range, or just unsuccessful, and people's jobs may be in jeopardy as a result. We talked earlier about the emotional investment people may have in the proposal. Understandably, offeror attendees will not be happy campers. Government attendees at a debriefing must always remain professional. Do not be argumentative. Do not debate. Do not allow yourself to be provoked. A debriefing is an exchange of information. It is not a debate. The government team must project an attitude of openness, honesty, and confidence in the process and the decision. That's good advice, Carol. We also have to emphasize that government personnel must never guess when answering an offeror's question. If you don't understand the question, always ask for clarification before answering. If you understand the question but don't know the answer, either temporarily adjourn the debriefing and hold a quick government caucus to find the answer, or tell the offeror you will provide a written answer at a later date. Providing a written answer at a later date should be an alternative of last resort. As your notional agenda suggests, the last thing you do at a debriefing is officially conclude the debriefing. If we leave questions unanswered with answers to be provided at a later date, the debriefing cannot be concluded until those questions are answered. Why is it so important to officially conclude the debriefing? Because the conclusion of a debriefing will start the offeror's protest clock. What is a protest clock? An offeror has certain procedural time frames it has to comply with if it wants to file a protest against the award of a contract. Generally speaking, if an offeror files a protest more than 10 days after either a pre-award or a post-award debriefing, the General Accountability Office will routinely dismiss the protest as untimely. In addition, if the offeror files a protest within five days of a post-award debriefing, the government is required to stop performance of the contract. Therefore, by including that last item on our agenda and formally stating to the offeror that this concludes the debriefing, we have a clear and verifiable point in time from which to count those five- and ten-day periods. Jack, this has been a very informative discussion. You and Carol taught me a lot about the briefings that I didn't know. You are welcome, Major. Glad I could help. One final thing to remind you about is proper documentation of the debriefing. In addition to the debriefing slides themselves, the source selection file should also include the offeror's request for a debriefing, as well as a written record of what occurred during the debriefing. In other words, who attended, what questions were asked, what answers were provided, what conversations occurred, 
and what handouts, if any, were passed out. Thanks to both of you. I am convinced that taking a little time like this early in the source selection to discuss and strategize about how we are going to handle debriefing unsuccessful offerers will pay big dividends later on. Don't forget to read the DOD source selection procedures and the Army source selection supplement for some valuable guidance also. Thank you.